What's up squad, it's your squid here at Ancient Squid Productions. I'm coming at you with another video for my history playlist today. So if you were expecting a reaction video and this is the first history video of mine you've actually seen, stick around, I think you might enjoy it. I will have some more reaction videos coming out later today, so don't worry if you don't, but if you do end up enjoying this snippet of Australian history, I've got a whole playlist, like I said, with this type of video as the focus. So check them out after you're done here and hit subscribe if you haven't already. This video is about William Dawes, a British naval lieutenant from the late 1700s. He was Australia's first astronomer, a three-time governor of Sierra Leone, some might say a pirate at some stages of his life, and absolutely, unequivocally, he was a good man. I will quickly mention before I get into it, in my research I came across a bloke named William Dawes Jr. from American history as well, and he was super fascinating as well. He was one of the guys who, much like Paul Revere, rode to warn of the British arrival near the beginning of the Revolutionary Wars for American independence. His son, Charles G. Dawes, was even Vice President and under the President Calvin Coolidge, America's 30th President. This video is not about that William Dawes, though I do think he's worthy of one and I'll probably make it at some point in the future once I've read more about him and more about American history in general, I guess. Once I feel confident enough in my knowledge about American history to act like a know-it-all on YouTube as I do with Australian history, you can guarantee I will, I promise. This video is about the William Dawes who was on the first fleet from Britain to Australia in the 1780s. Incidentally, I really wanted the two to be related, and I searched back three or four generations for each of them, looking for any glimmer of hope in that regard, but full disclosure, and in short, I couldn't find any connection. So unless I'm missing something, and as always, let me know in the comments section if you think I am missing something, regardless of what that something is, it's just a cool coincidence that they were both named William Dawes, and they were both stoic advocates for the native people where each of them had ended up. I wanted to mention the American Dawes because... Both of them refused orders from superior officers when it came to the unjust treatment of the people whose land they were on, and they both seem to prove, in my mind at the very least, that racism and barbarism were not simply the order of the day in either location. Both blokes named William Dawes prove there were people alive at the time of the American Revolution and at the time of Australian settlement who knew what was happening was fundamentally wrong and both had the courage to hold fast to their convictions and record their feelings of ill content for us future historians to observe. Although they both deserve to be remembered, from this point in the video I will only focus on the William Dawes who lived in what we now know as Sydney between 1788 and 1791. He was the first white man to attempt to learn an Aboriginal language. Before we get into that though, these guys are my patrons. Please consider making a monthly donation to the channel if you have the means and if you think I deserve it. A warning must go out to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers. Uh, some images that I'm going to be displaying alongside myself, much like this Patreon graphic for the rest of the video, will depict persons who have since passed away. So click away now if you need to. Now let's get into it. William Dawes is one of my favourite personalities from Australian history, so it always shocks me when my fellow Australians tell me they haven't ever heard of him. If you're from Sydney, or the surrounding areas, or if you've ever been to Sydney, I guarantee you've heard of or even been to Dawes Point, the place where he set up his astronomy observatory way back when. It's where one side of the Harbour Bridge sits, directly across the water from Luna Park. If you've ever been to the city, the chances are you've probably stood where he stood and you didn't even know it. It's the most picturesque and beautiful part of town. It faces out to the southern side of the harbour. It's called Dawes Point specifically because that's where Dawes set up his observatory. And that's where he had most of his interactions with the Eora people. The Eora Nation being the specific tribe or subset of Aboriginal people who lived in and around Sydney Harbour at the time of British arrival. But let's start at the beginning and work our way to Dawes Point, just like William did, shall we? William Dawes was born at Portsmouth, Hampshire in early 1762, the eldest child of Benjamin and Elizabeth Dawes. His father was a clerk and is of little relevance to this story. Dawes joined the Marines as a second lieutenant in September of 1779. 
He was wounded in action against the French Navy at the Battle of Chesapeake in 1781, and as a result, he was able to retire on half pay, and he could have lived out his days just like that. Not content with his legacy only being that of a wounded ex-soldier, Dawes volunteered for service with the New South Wales Marine Corps, which accompanied the first fleet of convicts to what we now know as Australia. Because he was known as a competent astronomer, he was asked by one of the king's advisers to establish an observatory and make astronomical observations along the voyage in the Pacific, as well as in New South Wales once he'd arrived. He was known as a competent astronomer, and on the recommendation of the Astronomer Royal, Reverend Dr. Neville Maskeline, the powers that be, officially known at the time as the Board of Longitude, supplied instruments and books for an observatory and asked Dawes specifically to watch for a comet that they were expecting to flutter by in about 1788. Spoiler alert, the comet never fluttered by. His application for a shore appointment as astronomer was initially refused, yet he was promised the first vacancy and meanwhile was expected to live with the rest of the Marines on the ship called the Sirius. From March 1788, he sort of got his wish, and he was employed ashore as an engineer and a surveyor instead of an astronomer. By early July, he'd been discharged from the Sirius completely. By that point in time, he'd already begun to build an observatory on what is now called Dawes Point, though at his request in those early days, and all the way up until the year 2002, it was called Point Masculine, after the Astronomer Royal who had sent him there. He devoted as much time as possible to observations, but as I mentioned earlier, the expected comet didn't end up appearing after all, and he had a job as a surveyor that was different to the astronomy job. The leader of the voyage to what we now know as Australia, Governor Arthur Phillip, was said to have a distaste for the scientific aspects of the trip. It is on record that he focused mainly on the subjugation of Aboriginal peoples and the setting up of a penal colony once he arrived. This difference in ideology between Dawes and Phillip would become apparent very quickly to both men and it would sour their relationship over time. In the colony's early days, Governor Phillip had several Aboriginal people captured in a largely fruitless attempt to learn their language and foster communication between the Eora and the colonists. Dawes would have started to learn the language from captured men such as Arabanu and Benelong, who I'll do videos on in the future, but his efforts would have been far more fruitful with folk who had come to him willingly. What a surprise, hey? Most Aboriginal people were afraid to enter the colony's main encampment at Sydney Cove. For good reason, if you think about it, given they'd been shot at the last time they saw white people. Eventually, many people, both Aboriginal and British, come to regard Dawes as a small, relatively isolated hut near the middle of the harbour as a safe and welcoming place to share friendships and knowledge. It was here that William Dawes was able to spend time with, and learn from, many different Aboriginal people, without risk of Phillips' men interrupting. The most notable relationship, in my opinion, to come out of the records kept by Dawes, was that of Dawes himself, and a young woman named Patty Garang, a local Gadigal woman aged about 15 at the time. Patia Garang, meaning grey kangaroo in her native tongue, appears to have been Dawes' main language teacher. She was to prove pivotal to his understanding and to his documenting of the Sydney languages. Dawes' notebooks record Patia Garang's frequent visits to his hut and their increasingly complex and intimate conversations as well. Expressions she shared with Dawes suggest a warm and trusting relationship some historians even like to embellish what records we have and claim their relationship was sexual in nature. There is a decent yet fictional book called The Lieutenant by Kate Grenville about Dawes that disputes that very theory much like I am today, but I'll reiterate now that it is fiction. Grenville uses a healthy dose of poetic license in her writing and it's not meant to be a serious recounting of the events. I'll say categorically right now so there is no confusion though. There is no evidence whatsoever that Dawes and Patty Garang had a sexual relationship at all. It's pure hypothesis to say as such, and I think it diminishes the work they were doing there, if I'm honest. Dawes' records of their friendship and exchanges have come to be regarded as the first study of local Aboriginal people and their culture. Prepared in 1789 and published as the Vocabulary of the Language of New South NS Wales, it consists of a series of unpublished field notes which document a number of conversations Dawes had with Paddy Garang and others. It gives the greatest insight we have today into the Karingai language and the people who spoke it. Unlike others who collected simple word lists for newly encountered items like weapons or animals, Dawes recorded conversational snippets that tell of the cultural and social contexts, personalities, and the actions and the feelings of the people he was interacting with. 
We still have the original documents in his handwriting, I've been showing them here, with his drawings and Paddy Grang's in safekeeping, and they're in storage with the Library of New South Wales. They've recently been digitised, and I've included a link to see them in the description of this video if you want to spend your time rifling through them and, and, and observing history that way. William Dawes was the first European to officially be recorded in Australia as defending Aboriginal rights. In retribution for the death of a gamekeeper, Governor Phillip had ordered several Marines, including Dawes, to capture two Aboriginal people from the Bidigal tribe, who lived on the peninsula at Botany Bay, and to sever the heads of ten men. Dawes flatly refused to participate, uh, as did his travelling companion and all-round good bloke Watkin Tench, and there'll be a video on him at some point in the future as well, depending on how well this one goes with the views, just saying. Their refusal to join a punitive expedition against Aboriginal people, as ordered by Governor Phillip in December of 1790, is widely considered the first example of a European act of conscience in defence of Aboriginal interests. Dawes and Tench were arrested for their refusal, and were forced at the threat of public hanging to participate as guides on the mission regardless. Despite their insubordination, both men were widely considered the best in their fields of exploration and interaction with Indigenous peoples, respectively. Some historians will tell you it was a coincidence that the men leading the mission to find Aboriginal pe people to kill didn't want to do it, and that the mission was unsuccessful in finding a single Aboriginal person that it had set out to. Knowing what we now know, I personally think Dawes and Tench did that on purpose. I believe they could have easily found Aboriginal people had they had the inclination, but I'll admit that's just speculation on my part, much in the same vein as other people speculate about Dawes and Paddy Garang's relationship. Due to his refusal to participate and his subsequent refusal to apologise publicly to Governor Philip once he'd been arrested for insubordination, William Dawes' application to stay in the colony as a free settler to continue his research was denied. He was sent back to England in September of 1791 and he was never allowed to come back to what we now know as Australia or Sydney. On his return to Britain, Dawes spent some time working with a man named William Wilberforce, who most historians will know as the driving force behind the abolition of slavery. Dawes would devote the rest of his life to the cause of the abolition of slavery also. Within a year, he'd accepted a post in Sierra Leone, where a colony was being established for former slaves to live in peace and freedom. His years in Sierra Leone were apparently some of the happiest in his life. During his time there, he married and had three children, and he was promoted to the rank of First Lieutenant. He became a councillor to the governor and played a major role in the design and construction of Freetown, which is still to this day the capital city of Sierra Leone and a major port when it comes to trade with African nations. He held the post of governor three times and he was one of the commissioners of enquiry who oversaw the transition of power from British officers to people native to the island when Sierra Leone became a crown colony in 1808. Over the years, the exploits of William Dawes have been overshadowed by those of other First Fleeters, such as heinous prick like Governor Arthur Phillip, uh, had the name of Masculine Point not been changed to Dawes Point in 2002 in order to honour the young lieutenant who established an observatory there in 1788, the memory of this enthusiastic and compassionate pioneer may have been forgotten forever. I hope you remember his name and his stance against race-based brutality from this point onward, and when you're standing where his observatory used to be. That concludes another history video though guys, thanks so much if you stayed this long and, and watched the length of this video. This type of content requires the most work out of any of the content on my channel when you add up all the research, script writing and multiple takes to get my mouth around the words I'm not used to saying. Uh, so every watch minute and view really means the world to me in this playlist. These guys are my patrons, they're the bee's knees. Feel free to click the link in the description and join them in turning some of your money into my money on a monthly basis. Let me know what you thought of this video in the comments section below, as always. Like the video if you think William Dawes was a good bloke. Suggest a person or event in history you'd like me to look into if you want. Uh, and most of all, subscribe so you can see the next video I make as soon as I make it. I'll see you when I look at you guys. You'll see me when you look at me. Thanks for watching.